Hello, land investors and outdoor enthusiasts. This is Josh with usrecland.com once again. Um, this time, we actually don't have a new listing. Uh, we have promised for a while we were going to dig into some educational stuff. So uh, this is going to be uh, basically a large overview. This is going to be a long video uh, to get started. Uh, this would, is excellent for someone who's been considering investing in land. Uh, maybe you've purchased a property or two and you think you want more. Perfect. Uh, even for those of you that are savvy land investors, uh, there might be a couple strategies near the middle to the end of this that you haven't considered before uh, that might be something of interest to you to just kind of additionally add on to your land investing strategy. So um, you won't hurt my feelings if you go to the video and want to fast forward through to where you um, feel like there's a topic of interest, uh, please do so. This is for you guys um, just trying to help people uh, be more responsible consumers in general, buy land correctly, um, mitigate some of the fears a little bit, uh, give you resources uh, to do just that, mitigate the fears because um, Every land company deals with someone uh, thinking they're a scam. So some of that stuff, we'll, we'll address that. So this is going to be a long one. Get your coffee, get your adult beverage of choice, uh, and just uh, sit down and listen. Or if you want to take notes, that's fine. I just want to present some ideas and some concepts and even a few resources. It, by no means am I exacting my uh, resources and folks on you that I pay attention to, just suggesting them and recommending them. You choose if you think there's someone that you'd like to listen to and uh, learn from. Okay. All right. That's the deal. As always, please uh, subscribe to US Rec Land and also subscribe to this YouTube channel and click the bell because we also send our new listings here on YouTube as well. So you get them right hot off the presses. All right. And to start with, when I get started here, I will go through just a mini version of um, the, inf the basic information on land to be looking for when you're a potential buyer. And I'm going to run through some of that basic stuff and give you um, kind of a rubric to run through uh, to filter it to determine if it meets your vision for the property and what you're looking to do with the property. Um, we'll go through that and I've done another video on that, but I'll do it here too, just so it's all in one video. Again, this is going to be a long form and then we'll run into, um, a lot of other strategies and, uh, profitability that can be had from land. Um, a lot of creative folks out there that do a lot of different things with land, um, that you might, might not even have ever thought of, although there, you do have to deal with the county. You got to make sure zoning's correct, all of that jazz, but things can be done. Um, there's some creative folks and when there's a will, there's a way. All right, so uh, land is a limited resource. I think everybody everybody here knows that. It's not sexy, it's not a glamorous villa on the coastal beaches of Southern Florida, palm trees swaying in the breeze, uh, waiting for someone to bring you a margarita. <laughs> Although that'd be great, right? Uh, it's old reliable. Uh, I, that's the best way. I was trying to think how I could summate what land is versus the myriad of other investments, stocks, bonds, et cetera. It's old reliable. Uh, our ancestors, our forefathers, a lot of those that developed wealth, it was through land ownership. They were land barons. And it wasn't necessarily just for the sake of owning the land and they weren't selling it. They were cultivating, they were working the land. They were utilizing natural resources. They were using the land in different ways uh, to monetize it, which made the land itself that much more valuable, right? Uh, so that still stands today. In fact, there's probably more opportunities than there were even for your ancestors um, when they were purchasing land and trying to primarily get farmland, have a place to put a homestead and uh, operate and give the family uh, living quarters, okay? So there's a lot more to it. Um, but basically, in terms of value as both a private and utilitarian resource and money investment, it's old reliable. Um, real estate, could uh, you could probably say land, real estate, both. Um, I'm kind of merging those two here. Um, in my opinion, everyone should begin building a private land portfolio. Uh, every single family, median income, uh, less than median. And if you're less than medium, let's work on that. 
but you, your family should start working on developing a private land portfolio. Vacant land can have a myriad of monetizations um, while holding the property prior to sale, if you're looking to sell it later for a flip uh, to make margin um, beyond your purchase, um, which makes it a compelling investment for those in the know. You have an asset with multifaceted characteristics and possibilities. Again, at face value, it doesn't look that sexy to a lot of folks, uh, but there are a lot of creative things people have done with vacant land and rural areas that they just work. And uh, there's also, I might add, there's a growing social leaning. Folks want to get out of the city. They want to escape the queue. They want to get in nature. And, and I'm talking about people that are, they, they, they didn't grow up in nature. They didn't grow up in the woods, out fishing, out hunting. There's just something innate where some of this technology is kind of bringing and teasing that out in folks that otherwise might have just lived their entire life in, in the city. They want to get out. They want to experience nature and things. I think it's a great thing uh, if, if technology is what caused it. Whatever, man, that's great. Um, so at any rate, I digress. So only you can decide if land investing is right for you. <laughs> I know a lot of people um, slam land, and I know there's a lot of arguments even between other investments, you know, crypto versus the stock market, the stock market versus real estate versus, um, I mean, I know there's a lot of arguments that it, it really boils down to where do you have an expertise? Um, you, you should never invest in something that you don't have a level of knowledge to mitigate the risk and also know when you have a good opportunity. Um, and that's part of it is educating yourself. So hopefully this helps kind of jumpstart that and you just use this to go look at other YouTube channels, other websites and investigate whatever particular concept is of interest to you. I, I highly recommend lifelong learning. Uh, it's definitely nice to have a skill set. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of uh, the fruit of life to just keep learning new things and experience new stuff, right? All right, so um, let's get into some reasons. Now, this uh, reasons to invest in land. This list is in a prioritized order. And, and uh, just so you know, providing uh, reasoning initially from uh, almost a Dave Ramsey frame of mind, worst case scenario, and then working out from security towards prosperity and fully capitalizing on multiple opportunities uh, that land can offer. Um, if, if any of you know Dave Ramsey, if you don't, basically he takes a very extremely conservative approach, which by the way, I'm not knocking it. I watched Dave Ramsey. Um, although there's other modes of thinking, if you can be responsible, you don't necessarily have to follow his plan, but I digress. Um, basically, it's extremely conservative. He doesn't want you to have debt if you don't have to. Again, that's a good thing. Um, and to be very, very disciplined with your money, increase your income and have a savings in case uh, something hits. He wants you to have three to six months. I think it's six months of stacked away income in an account that's easily liquid uh, that you can gain access to. And uh and again, he wants you to have an emergency fund. He doesn't want you to have a huge bank note on your home. He doesn't want you to have a lot of financing out there because if one day uh, something happened out of the blue unexpectedly, you, it could be the source of your financial ruin. Um, I do like that aspect. Part of this here with the land, I'm kind of following that modality is, okay, before we become a land investor, flipping land, monetizations and all that, which is at the closer to the middle and end of this list, what do we need to do to take care of you? What if your condo or home in the city, um, what if there was an issue? What if there was a uh, social and economic decline? Um, and, and there were, there were uh, you know, security issues and you had to get out of your home. Where would you go? Would you have food? Would you have water? Would you have shelter? Would you have uh, the ability to defend your family? So I'm kind of going to follow uh, almost like a, uh, a preference to sustainability order of prioritization. Because if you have even one small parcel uh, of land elsewhere from your primary residence in your home, that's a nice backup option. And I don't even know how to value that uh, in terms of an investment. Um, that could be a lifesaver. Now, 
we all hope that doesn't happen, correct? Right, correct. So we hope that doesn't happen, but wouldn't, wouldn't it be peace of mind? Again, how do you put a value on that? If you had a secondary property, doesn't have to be 30 acres, right? You can grow a lot of food on small acreage. Well, I take the, depending on where you're at in the United States. Um, but if you have decent soil, you typically can grow and there's ways you can get yield. You can feed your family, wild game, water sources. It would need to be filtered, but you get my drift in an emergency, worst case scenario, gold isn't going to help you, but we'll, we'll get into that. So I'm going to follow that priority of what, what do we, we need security first with the land and then we'll move from security to, okay, this is becoming more than just a security blanket for me. Maybe I can monetize some things and have um, generate some yield off of this. Now it, there might be yield that's monetary or it just might be a resource like you know, maybe it's a place where you can grow food that you can't at your home and it's saving you money on groceries. You know where the food's coming from. You're teaching the kids how to do the same. Uh, again, there's just so many different things that there's no way that I can cover all the different ways that you could use the land. It just depends on you and um, the way you view the world and what you'd like to do. All right. So we'll get into that list momentarily, but real quick, what I want to do is I'm just going to do a quick run through. I did a video on this, but I want you to have a basic structure of what you're looking for with land. All right. Now I'm assuming something here that you have a vision for the property, that you know what you want to do, and you've got it specific, right? The the smart goal kind of method, if you remember that. All right. It's got to be kind of specific. I mean, you can have some wiggle room whether you want a mobile home or manufactured home, but even that you really need to be specific because some zoning will not allow mobile homes, but it'll allow a manufactured home. So, and therein is a great segue. All right, so I'm just gonna use this property that's listed here. Um, I'm gonna use this uh, land, about the land, okay? All right, so first of all, I need to know my budget. Realistically, if I pay, to work with, why am I looking at $34,000 land? Just not being mean, just being realistic. Cause I do the same thing. You get into dream mode and you start bending your own rules. You gotta stick to your budget or don't start looking until you've put that money away. Use that to reinforce uh, taking extra bonuses and putting extra money away. When the time comes, you can pay cash. So you're gonna get a deal with a cash deal. Um, and oh, by the way, I will mention here, relevant, if you, if you enter an owner financing contract, first you need to understand that owner financing contracts, um, if you don't make your payments on time, they keep all of the money. You can get a lawyer, but it's in the contract. And I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, but I know a lot of land companies and they don't give money back when someone defaults, even if they get the lawyer most of the time. Uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm just telling you, it's not that great. And, but more importantly, you can't do anything until the notes paid off. Technically, you cannot enter the premises, you can't build or anything. So if you have a 10 year note, you've already put back your plans 10 years. And again, not being mean, I understand it's not in the cards for everyone to pay cash for land. I get it. But again, I'd rather you start getting serious and find ways to put money away for two or three years and then go out into the market with a handful of cash because I know you're going to pay it off and you're going to be have it immediately available to you to develop and utilize in the manner you want. And you've already accounted for it in your current household monthly budget. It's not, it's not going to hurt you. Hopefully, hopefully you're a responsible consumer and you can... Um, and you don't have to worry about giving money away unnecessarily because, uh, you know, you get a long bank note. Who knows if you're going to lose a job or have some uh, significant impact to your income that prevents you from making the payments and then you lose out on the contract. So be careful with the owner financing. I know a lot of folks do it and they give you, you know, 50 bucks down, 120 bucks a month from here into eternity. I would never buy land that way ever ever if, if you don't have the, there's just some things if you don't have the money don't, don't enter a contract all right 
uh, I'll get off my soapbox. All right, this one just happens to have parcel numbers because there's a uh, corridor parcel. Your, the parcel number is important. Um, so for a lot of you folks who always wonder about buying stuff, land's straightforward. You can verify so many things that you can get three or four things. If they don't drive, well, maybe there is something up. But even then, um, that, that doesn't necessarily mean there's a scam. And I, I'll get into it. So your parcel number is what you're going to reference when you contact the county. And you should contact the county on any land that you're potentially looking at buying. And you should mark down the name, the date, who you spoke with, and and what information they're providing. Okay, so you you definitely want to use the parcel. Now, most counties across the United States, they have online data. You can search the parcel number yourself as a county. As long as you type the parcel number in correct, you'll be able to pull up data. You'll be able to verify the owner of the parcel? Is it the company that's trying to sell the land or are they selling it on behalf of another party? Okay, you wanna know that because if someone approaches me online and says, hey, I've got land for sale and it's in someone else's name, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be a little, little apprehensive. Now, I will tell you, the counties are slower than molasses on a winter day, all right? <laughs> So a lot of land that we buy, and I can speak on behalf of other land companies, it's sold before the county ever finished recording it on their site. The land company has the deed, and they should have a recorded notarized deed that the county already acknowledged it, but sometimes they're not so quick at recording that. So don't get alarmed right away. Ask the land company for a copy of the recorded notarized deed. And you might say, well, someone could fabricate that. Yeah, they could, but here's the other thing. Ask for a copy, reference the parcel number, and call the county and say, do you have a transaction pending for new ownership on this property? This is public information. You know, they're not going to give you the new landowner security, but they can tell you actually it's pending for ownership of this party. And then you can verify, okay, it was just the county's just slow at updating their records, they actually do own it. So now I've verified they have full authority to sell that property. Well, at that level anyway, all right? Um, on our stuff, we list Google Maps, Google Earth satellite coordinates because vacant land doesn't have mailing addresses. And I would think that would be common sense. We get a lot of people that ask that, well, if it's vacant land, that doesn't mean what, what domicile are they using to live there? Where's the mailbox to receive the mail for the residents? There is no residence, right? Now, our properties where there is a mailing address, and those are other situations and scenarios, but, but for the most part, vacant land doesn't have a mailing address. Um, you can know what road it's on, but to really get to where the exact location of the parcel is, we utilize the XY coordinates. You could uh, use that for driving direction. Now, depending on what you want to do, your zoning is important. Okay, even if it's residential and you know you want to build, if you want to put a mobile home up, well, in that said, just because it's residential, there might be a couple things that you have to consider uh, in your own vision. A lot of um, a lot of counties in Florida will only let you uh, put a mobile home that's. 15 years old or less. So if you got a deal from your brother for a mobile home that's in good condition, you know, from 2003, that's not going to work. Okay. And you need to know that before you take the time, energy, and money uh, to try to put your vision in motion. And then they tell you, hey, by the way, you got to remove that mobile home at your expense. And you're still starting from scratch to put your new home on the land, vacant land that you purchased. So avoid those pitfalls down in this zoning. Again, that's part of your conversation with the county. Here's what I want to do. How much are the permits? What are what are your requirements? Um, get that straight from the horse's mouth and document it because unfortunately, the counties are notoriously inconsistent. So make sure that you speak, if you don't feel the person speaking to you is confident in the information and data they're providing, 
ask to move to a manager or someone else that, that is more knowledgeable, okay? Don't leave a purchase of this magnitude and significance up to the new guy that just got there three months ago. <laughs> but I think most of you, most of you can handle and navigate that conversation and would do just that to make sure that you get solid information. So good. All right. Um, taxes on vacant land are cheap for the most part. It's not breaking the bank. But you do need to realize as soon as you put an improvement, the county is going to have their hand up and say, oh, your land and the improvements value has increased significantly. We'd like to collect more property tax from you. So be aware of that once you improve the property, okay? Um, and then your utilities, you're connecting. If you're in a rural area, you're looking at either alternative sources or um, you're looking for, uh, uh, well, if it's in a rural area, you're looking to drill a well, uh, a septic, you'll need to contact the county. You'll need to get all of the specific details on what they're going to require, how much their permits are. Are they going to require an inspection at different series stages throughout the development of those? Um, are they going to require one of their electricians to inspect or connect to the grid? The answer is most likely yes, uh, because they're maintaining the right of way. Um, so be sure that you understand you're becoming your own general contractor. Okay. All right, so those are just the basics. Again, I just want to reiterate, um, verifying that someone owns land or real estate is very easy. Um, so the folks that just go on and call a scam, they're just silly. They just, they're lazy. They don't want to do anything. You just need to go. If they've given, if they haven't given you the parcel, the parcel number in the county and all that information, yeah, it probably is a scam but the county assigns the parcel number. So therefore it's recorded by an unbiased third party. Take the parcel number, go to the county website, verify who owns it, does it match the company? And if it doesn't, again, that doesn't necessarily mean there's a scam. It might just mean that the county's just behind or they're just slow recording and updating their records. There, there might already be, uh, well, there should be a deed uh, that's already been acknowledged by the county and recorded with them that they've acknowledged. Um, they just haven't updated their online records yet. Okay. Uh, again, this stuff's easy. And then for the entity itself, uh, it's a company, uh, they're registered with their state. They're registered with an EIN with the federal government. If you're trying to scam folks, this is the worst way to do it because there's so many uh, imbalances there use that to verify the seller very easy again uh, we we just, and i'm i'm kind of doing this as uh my, my good deed for land companies because everybody's online calling it a scam they know nothing about it because now with those two or three things you can verify real quick if someone sounds legit or not okay all right so that's the basics we're going to get out of there with the basics here. Now, let's get into the reasons uh, in prioritized order, why you should buy land. And um, I am I am gonna promote something and hopefully some other folks get on board with me in the land community. I'm gonna, I'm gonna promote something called the Great American Buyback. And as it pertains to land, okay? Um, well, We'll, we'll get into it here. How about, oh, cool. oh. there's our website, by the way. And uh, yeah, shameless plug. If you want to try and find some land, check us out. But um, in terms of what I'm about to say about this great American buyback, uh, I don't care where you get it. I'm just uh, presenting this as a concept for you to wrap your mind around. And the quicker you start, the better. Uh, create some memories with family and traditions uh, so that your legacy lives on well beyond your passing off this earth, okay? Um, so what I'd like to propose is something called the Great American Buyback uh, of Land. Uh, there are a lot of entities that are buying up real estate and they're buying up land. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little more detail, but 
Reason number one is buying land as peace of mind, but also peace of mind, again, meaning if I have a, a bug out place or a backup plan, if for some reason I was pushed out or forced out of my single family, uh, you know, my residence with my family, do I have a backup plan that already has resources and shelter for me? All right. So peace of mind as a legacy, tradition, build traditions with your family, going to the property on 4th of July, you know, hanging out there, or maybe it's by a lake or a river, going out to the lake or the river on certain holidays, going riding, fishing, hunting, all of those things build tradition and legacy in your family. Um, homesteading, vacation, or retirement properties. Um, and this is all personal reasons. This is for you. But the reason I mentioned that is number one is because there's kind of an overlap on the peace of mind, bug out survival shelter, homestead that has gardens and the ability to grow food should you need to leave your primary residence. So that's why I have that as number one, is that's the number one reason, whether it's monetized or not, right? So that's a good reason. And even if you purchased it for all of those reasons, you can always sell it later. Uh, for hopefully an increase in value and make a little money off the sale of your property. So there's still a little monetization there. But again, we're kind of following a Ramsian method of emergency funds, security first, and then we'll move to prosperity. All right. So I would mention that land is a historically safer investment than most new age technology like Bitcoin, NFTs, and day trading. Um, although I know there's folks that are effective at it. Again, the first rule of investing, invest in what you know. If you don't know it, it's so it's not a good investment for everybody because they don't understand it. So you folks that want to tell me how great it is, that's okay. I understand. In fact, I'm in a little bit of Forex stuff right now. But at any rate, um, and some of the more traditional investments like stocks, bonds, gold, um, even housing to some degree, land can sometimes even be a little bit better. It's actually a little more stable, uh, to be honest, than some of the other areas because uh, the real estate can really fluctuate. Um, but land should really be used in unison to diversify your por portfolio of investments. It wouldn't necessarily be my lead flag bearer of my investments, but as you'll see as we go down the list, to the degree that you want to develop it, it could be a highly lucrative and it could be your full-time gig um, depending on what land utilization strategy you get into. Again, more on that as we go. Um, uh, during the early 2000s, the market crashed when real estate went haywire and the economy crashed. I mean, land kept chugging and it felt less of an impact than most other investments. Again, it's stable, it's very durable, um, inexpensive to maintain. Uh, you saw, I mean, land property taxes are typically under a hundred bucks. And if they're not, they're a hundred or 200 bucks a year compared to three and 4,000 a year property taxes for uh, homes, single family homes in some places. Um, but uh, more, more details on the investment side further down our list, let's keep moving. Um, the, other, the other thing here is you don't have, there's no leaky toilets, foundation issues pestering tenants and her billionaire influences that can cut the bottom out of your investment. Um, that's another reason to buy vacant land as kind of a peace of mind legacy or uh, vacation retirement property. And then from 2020 to 2021, uh, there's been an increase of 155%, 155% in rural land sales. Again, a lot of folks want to get out of the queue. They lived in the city their whole life and they see their friends going hiking, fishing, hunting and trying new things and having fun and kind of, I don't know, I think maybe it's uh, rediscovering themselves or something, maybe a part of them that was never discovered before. Uh, maybe that's a better way to put it, I, I don't know. Um, but I think it, it can be easy to sit in front of a screen and stay in a bubble and just not experience a lot of stuff, right? Um, but with that said, most investors opt for apartment buildings, multifamily houses, and single family houses for now. 
Uh, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm, what I'm merely saying is land has a place with other things uh, and many investment plays or maybe personal plays. Maybe it's just a personal reason. You want a patch of property you can go to to get away from the hustle and bustle. That, I mean, that has value, especially if it um, helps you kind of um, reset, resharpen the saw, if you will. All right. So again, just having land as kind of a legacy play tradition, it also doubles as a bug out survival place. If you want it to, you can set caches, you can, um, you know, dig a cellar, uh, you can have uh, food stores, you can have a large garden plot there, um, which uh, gives you reasons to go out to the property, show the kids things and work as a family. And then if something ever happened, you've already got a backup plan just sitting there and you're doubling it is almost like a vacation, um, just fun property, right? So, all right, so that's, that's number one. Number two, and again, we're going in priority here, with, the, with my idea for the great American buyback here, we're gonna dig more into this. So it's basically why you need to do your part for your family and future generations. Uh, well, land is always going to have future scarcity. They're not making any more of it. And the more big box retailers that come in and buy it in foreign entities and folks in other countries that own US soil, that creates instability for the folks that live here. I don't know about you, but I like the idea of owning the land below my feet and not renting from someone uh, and being at their control for rent increase. Um, uh, there's just a myriad of issues with that, okay? Um, but for the land, they're not making any more of it. Uh, one of the large billion dollar real estate hedge funds, they reported that 35% of single family homes were owned by commercial entities, not private citizens. One third. Why does this matter? They aren't making any more of it. Yes, unless we colonize Mars, which equals more terra firma, yeah. However, location, 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 right? Do you wanna to go to Mars to get a new land plot or would you do a little bit more convenient play and? stay here in the US and, and buy it, exactly. But all kidding aside, they're predicting in just a few decades, the average private citizen will not own a home. Homes are built on land. Couple this with the land grab by top investors like Bill Gates, um, Warren Buffett, and, and others. Uh, I, I believe uh, Merv Griffin, uh, the game show mogul, I might be incorrect there might be a different gentleman, uh, but I think it was Merv Griffin owns a significant amount of land. And there's another fellow who I think he's actually at the top of the list currently. He owns a lot of land, um, but I, I couldn't remember his name, so I apologize. Um, but those, those folks are all out buying farmland. That's land too. So between the big, big box retailers and real estate investors, all of the big billionaire investors buying up farmland, and then foreign entities in foreign countries purchasing land, uh, I can see where this is going. Hopefully you're understanding that as well. It's gonna be a very highly sought after commodity to own your home 50 years from now and not be beholden to paying rent to some government or big business that owns it. And that's your only opportunity to put a roof over your head. I'm not a fan of that plan man. So uh, the private citizens should worry about control over their own household economy in the future, not to mention the loss of control of the private farmland. You don't want to depend solely on the government for your food. I mean, this would mean someone else controls domestic production and thus the distribution and pricing thereof. You, you're following me here, right? Land grows food, whether you have 0.10 acre or 100 acres, you can grow a surprising crop volume from a relatively small plot, um, more than enough to feed a family, even a large family, even a couple of families, depending on certain variables, but for the most part, you can. 
You can optimize yield by using <clears throat> techniques like vertical planters, raised beds, lattice structures for vining plants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am by no means a master gardener, but um, I wasn't born with a green thumb, but I, I, I know my way around soil and plants enough to, to make it happen. <laughs> all right. So what I'm, what I'm promoting here is that all American families begin buying a private portfolio of land and developing that private portfolio for the sake of a collective great American buyback. We're trying to get everyone, if everyone owned two or three parcels of land, even median income families, you, as that was part of their investment and long-term strategy, we would be able to privately amass a lot of land. And that's the key is when someone else owns it and we're not selling to corporations or private entities, you can maintain control of that land and all of the myriad of utilities and resources. Um, with oil and gas, I'll just touch on this real quick. Um, like for example, typically Ohio and West Virginia, I think it's, they need the big oil and gas companies need 30 to 40 acres contiguously. And maybe there's someone on here that knows a little bit more about it. But the point is, is do you think that they'd rather just own the land instead of having to pay you royalties and go knocking door to door and say, hey, we've got all your neighbors. We just need your six acres to lock this all in so we can drill. They'd rather just own it outright and just start buying up land so they don't have to worry about meeting those regulations so that they can tap new resources and make more money. Now, I'm not making the gas and oil companies the bad guy here. I'm simply saying, follow human psychology and logic and reason. You can see where this could go if someone had malintent, right? Okay. So again, um, I'm going to keep on this great American buyback and I'm gonna talk about different things on these education videos with that as kind of like the overarching concept is for whatever reason you want land, get it. You're helping all of us collectively buy back America and maintain a majority hold on the most important resource in this country, owning the country itself, right? All right, I beat that up, let's move on. All right, and then as it would go, uh, the next likely logical priority would be if you already have the land for other reasons, or if you don't wanna buy land for those reasons, buy and hold investing or land banking for your private portfolio that you might sell five, 10, 15 years down the road. Or maybe you're, that's one play. Your second play is using the land to grow things and sell them in a market or something while you're waiting to flip the land later. And that's, that's one of the strategies for land is stacking multi-usages. And the way you do that is you in, integrate that into your process of vetting properties. How many different strategies can I employ on this particular piece of land based on zoning, where it's located, the temperament, the soil? Because if you can stack two, three, or four different strategies that are viable strategies for that land, now you've got options and you've basically insulated your investment. You, no matter what exit strategy you need to employ in the future, you'll have something. It's not, um, it, it's not a one hit wonder, okay? So land, land is required. It, it doesn't require any additional or ongoing work uh, as compared to like other investment classes like real estate itself, um, like a house needs a roof, mechanicals, electrical, there needs to be maintenance, painting it. Um, you've got your property taxes, which are pretty large. And even if you have a property that's vacant, you still need to keep the lights on, keep things in working order. Um, so there are, there are a lot of uh, overhead costs that are associated with that. Um, but land has minimal maintenance. As, long, as a long-term hold, annual property taxes are nothing. Uh, it's easy to find motivated sellers to buy um, low and sell with significant margins on land, uh, meaning you would have the ability to buy land far less than market value than you would a home, okay? So the opportunities are there. You just have to know how to look for them. 
and that by you being able to purchase at uh, significantly less than market value, it puts you in the catbird seat to sell it for market value and take a profit. All right. And uh, you only need to duplicate that process several times, flip several pieces of land, and you've got some excellent profits. Uh, again, once you know what you're doing, there's a whole there's a whole uh, learning sequence that would need to take place before you're investing in land. All right. And uh, let's see, I think we've kind of beat that up too. Um, oh yeah, the other thing is add owner financing for increased volume. Now I said in the beginning here, I would never buy land owner financing. And again, just for full transparency, there are land companies, their entire business model is based around owner financing and they're thriving and doing well. Notice who I said is thriving and doing well. The land company that owns the note that you're paying cash flow on. So which position do you think you should be in? The borrower or the lender? Right. So if, you're, if you want to employ that strategy, don't employ it as the buyer, as I said in the beginning. Uh, again, there's nothing wrong with maybe a, a short-term owner financing for six months or something like that. Um, but even then, you can lose money if something were to happen during those six months and you can't pay the note. All of the money you forfeit because it's non-refundable. Um, but put yourself in the spot of the lender and you have cash flow on that property. And another part of that strategy is since it's non-refundable, and they have not completely fulfilled the contract if they miss a payment. That means that you still own the deed to the land. They, they didn't fulfill their contract to purchase and all of their payments were non-refundable, which means as soon as they default based off the uh, outline of your contract, you uh, go ahead and put it back up for marketing. So you might, you might get paid for that property uh, through two or three different cycles before you finally sell it. Um, although I would also mention another reason I don't like owner financing is if you bought a property for five grand and you're trying to sell it for eight and you finance it for five years and you finally get someone after the, let's say someone signs a contract to purchase for two years and they pay you, I don't know, $2,000. Well, they default after two years. Then you get someone else and they sign a contract and they sign a five-year note. Well, now, it, and let's say that the second person even fulfilled it. You're at eight years to realize the full margin and profit off of that. Yeah, you got a little bit extra cheddar from the first round, but man, oh man. I mean, eight years to make 5,000 bucks, you didn't even make a thousand bucks a year on that deal. So just be very careful with that strategy, make sure there's enough meat on the bone. Now you can, when there's owner financing, you can typically, you know, add a little to the top since you're giving them convenience of smaller payments. A ten thousand dollar property could easily be twelve or thirteen with a down payment. Okay, but again, I don't want to tell you not to do something if you feel that it would work for you. I just want you to understand the caveats and you make the decision. Full transparency. Uh, or just do cash sales only. You might wait a little bit longer, but you're realizing the full ROI and profit margin in two, three, four months. And then you're taking the profits and buying your next property. And that cycle, the speed of that cycle is what's important to you as a land investor. All right. So, and no, not everybody's on here to become a land investor. Just want to present a number of concepts to play with. And you can obviously do more research on that. Uh, that is not a problem, okay? And uh, let's go here. So there are a lot of good resources and I'm, I am just want to give you a handful. I'm not going to have resources for everything here. I don't want to tell you what to do, but I know some of you are absolute beginners and you're just starting. So I figured I'd just give you something to get started. Uh, this is a YouTube channel for homesteading. They seem to be very good um, providing homesteading information from a more realistic and utilitarian standpoint, which is important because you're trying to survive. 
uh, and they're doing it as a family and they kind of have a broad swath of different things that they're doing. So maybe check them out, Homesteading Family. It's on YouTube, you can find it. Again, I have no affiliation with them. I, I don't even know them, I haven't reached out to them, but it seems like they, they know what they're doing and they're making an honest attempt uh, to inform people and educate you. So that might be a great starting point for someone who's looking for uh, a property to eventually homestead, make a bug out, bug out or uh, survival property uh, if things went haywire in the big city. Um, something there for you to consider. And then for those of you that also um, are looking for the survivability and uh, being prepped, preppers, uh, that element, uh, this, is a, this, this is an excellent panel. And again, you don't have to, but uh, he knows what he's doing. He's a former uh, Green Beret and uh, worked on special forces. He does a lot of overlanding as well, in addition to the firearm training. He does a lot with ham radios if the grid went down. Uh, he does a lot of that. Again, a lot of overlanding with his vehicle, how to get a bug out pack set up correctly, um, how to kind of read the terrain. Uh, but that's a good you know, if that's something you're interested in coupling with your homestead survivability, uh, self-sustaining. Um, strategy on your land, fieldcraft survival. Um, and I forget his name. I can't believe I forgot his name. But at any rate, that's a good panel there. Um, and then also, I tend to keep track of other investments uh, so that I can accurately compare them to land and see what might impact land or um, maybe a new new event that kind of changes my dynamic and thought process on land as an investment versus other investments. Uh, but she seems to be a very um, eclectic um, voice on that. She was actually an insider at the uh, Dallas Fed, uh, Danielle DiMartino Booth, and she owns an intelligence company called Quill. But she's very good at taking all types of different assets well beyond the stock market and bonds, um, you know, commodities, gold, land, real estate. And she's very insightful how all the big picture and what impacts what. Uh, and she's very good at that. So this is just something uh, she's just one of those folks I came across and felt I saw a couple of videos and thought, man, she she's very insightful and knows a lot about a lot of different things and investment types. And more importantly, what economic drivers move them up or down. So something there. And she's not particularly land, but again, I'm watching other investments and how they move that might impact land values. And it may be something that impacts land going up or down, maybe something that's that I haven't considered before. So again, it's helpful, great. It's the only reason I'm throwing it out there, I don't have a we don't have a money deal <laughs> or something trying to give you helpful resources if you're just starting out and need different um, data to start thinking about it properly so you don't make mistakes initially. And then this gentleman, um, in terms of ideas of how to cultivate the natural landscape and resources of a property, uh, he does a great job. I believe he's a, uh, he is a, uh, he, he teaches at Oregon, Oregon University. Uh, he does a lot with permaculture and aquaculture, uh, developing the land almost in a synergistic way, uh, in symbiotic relationship between the plants and the water. And he kind of puts system, I, I would call it natural systems. He's very good at putting them together. So if you were going to develop a homestead and we're looking to naturally uh, develop it in concert with the home itself, he would be a, a good person to watch. Again, I don't know him. I don't. I haven't talked to the guy, but everything I've watched, he seems to be very insightful with a leaning towards just a transparent and goodwill, good faith, giving you information type guy. All right. So feel free to check that guy out, and we'll get back to going through our uh, our other list here. Okay. Let's pull this up. All right. So now. Um, uh, the other part of land is we have a number of folks that reach out to us to buy land and they want to buy the land as a private developer, meaning 
We have a construction team. They themselves are typically in construction or uh, they have uh, immediate family members that construction is their trade. And maybe they even have a property management team or they were a property manager at one time themselves. And what they're doing is they're purchasing land uh, as cheaply as they can. And they're putting mobile homes, manufactured homes, single family homes on them as long-term rentals hold. And then of course, if you develop the property in the future, as real estate and land goes up, you could sell it for a profit. We have a lot of private uh, developers, I would call them. I know they're not, they're not doing 500 homes a year, but, but still um, your family could do well with one of these strategies. If you could find the right land and you already have a, uh, a plan to develop. Uh, I know some folks have worked, have, purchase land to put tiny homes on them or to create a tiny home community, uh, small cabins. Uh, so it's all it's all possibilities in there. You just have to check zoning, talk to the county, and follow those initial basic steps we talked about before to make sure that your plan and your vision for that property is not going to have a big snag. You might have some small snags that you can work around, uh, and maybe you need to build something a certain way to fulfill that, but just have the conversation with the county so you know what exactly that is you need to do so you meet their criteria and you can move on with your life and not have to look over your shoulder after things are built and developed. All right, that's the best way to do it. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> and uh, also another, uh, what we might mention here is that um, Land is a better hedge than gold. We kind of touched on it a little bit before, um, but uh, all I've heard my whole life is you need to get gold. It's a hedge if the stock market goes down or has a large disruption and uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, well, gold in recent years has not done what it's supposed to when the stock market's down. It went down with it. And also too, I would argue your gold, if if the if if the economy is having that big of a drop, if it drops to the next level, your gold's not gonna. It's not gonna be worth anything. Now you could argue, well, neither are your stocks, right? But I don't buy stocks. I have land, though. That land has a, that land value increases if we devolve to Mad Max. <laughs> now I have a place to go. Now a place to kind of hide out away from things. Hopefully I have some resources, water, a garden. Um, maybe I have firearms. Maybe I've got a cash. Maybe I've got stored food. I mean, I, again, I, we don't want that to happen, but uh, that gold isn't going to help me one bit. What am I going to do? Throw it at someone. So I am not a gold fan. Um, I love watching the videos when these guys roll up in Rolls Royces and watches and fancy suits telling you to buy gold when there's no way that they bought them from gold. <laughs> Go look at the gold chart from like 1875. There's a hundred other things you could do with your money. Okay. Uh, so Josh doesn't like gold. I know I'm going to hear it from all the gold investors, how much money they made five, six years ago that went away recently, by the way. Um, Bitcoin, land beats Bitcoin. Bitcoin literally right now, again, that was supposed to be touted as the great hedge with gold. What's it doing? It's literally following the NASDAQ almost identically. The lines overlap, which that's just the stock market. It's not a hedge. It's following the stock market. I like land for a myriad of reasons. Okay. Now, again, I know there's a lot of you that are going to say, well, Josh, I made $150,000 in Bitcoin seven years ago. Good for you, man. Great. I don't know that that has a long-term strategy built in. If it follows the NASDAQ, if you're doing that, well, why don't you just start um, doing long-term holds, value investing like Warren Buffett in the stock market? Same thing. And it's based on real commodities and real businesses that are a little bit more tangible than the Bitcoin. I understand blockchain. I understand, I understand that. And there might be a day where the blockchain currency works. I just don't know if it's right now. But at any rate, um, they're not the hedges of inflation that they've been touted to be, but 
land will always stand. Just remember that. <laughs> and as a nice bonus, remember, see all the perks about owning the earth below your feet and having plenty of room to grow your own food, harvest wild game, have a readily available water source. Of course, you have to bring to a rolling boil for 23 and a half minutes or whatever it is. But hey, that's better than having nothing if stuff went awry. Uh, plus, if you need gold for a hedge to the economy, taking, tanking, <laughs> it's not a far stretch for it to fall further, like I said. And water, food, guns, and gas are going to be far more valuable than a shiny mineral in, in a barter based system. It's just not going to. It's, it's nothing. Uh, in fact, I, I remember an interview with Warren Buffett um, and they were asking him, uh, that Joe guy, I think it's MSNBC, you guys probably know. They were asking Warren Buffett about gold and he said, well, you give me a piece of gold the size of this room, what am I gonna do with it? It just sits there. And, it, and he used the juxtaposition of the gold versus farmland, which is land by the way. And he's one of the guys buying farmland they want into your food source. They know that as the population grows, that food prices are going to go up. They know that there's a guaranteed business play on food prices. They know you're going to buy it. So how do you counteract that? The great American buyback, get your own land to grow your own food, harvest animals, set up a uh, salt lick. I, I mean, do it all, do it all, man. And make it a place that's fun too. Go ride four wheelers, go hang out and camp by the fire. Maybe it's by the lake. That's a nice food source. You got fish to eat, um, place to have fun. And it's uh, back, oh man, uh, don't get me started. I like land, we like land. That's why we're in the business. Not, not just because we can make money, we like land. We're outdoors, we fish and hunt and we like camping and things ourselves. We're simple guys sit me by the fire with a beer and a steak, we're all is well in the world. Very simple, right? I don't need fancy blockchain Bitcoin and hope that it goes up and then it goes down on me. All right, um, let's see where we're at here. Um, that, I think we've gone through the, the blockchain stuff a little, I'm probably being harsh with it, so no worries. Um, the next part is uh, the the permaculture and aquaculture. So land with a water resource when you're buying, that's of high importance. Even if it's not on your land, maybe just in the vicinity, if you're making it part of your checklist as a bug out property, if stuff went crazy. Um, but having fish available, drinking water, cooking, cleaning, necessity for life, daily activities. Uh, again, that fella from Oregon University, great with permaculture, aquaculture, using the natural landscape and fauna and flora within the space. Uh, you know, it's almost like he's doing a natural environment feng shui to a degree, okay? Really, really, really good. So I, I recommend it, but of course, there's other folks online that you can check out too, all right? Um, another reason to buy land is uh, actually up in my neck of the woods. We're in Ohio and mineral resources um, and uh, mineral rights. Uh, so I'm handling it as two. So up where I'm at, natural gas and uh, oil is, is big. Uh, we're in the Marcellus Shale and uh, what's the other one? I forget what it is. Oh, the Marcellus and Utica Shale reserves are under the ground. And, and, and around Southern Ohio, PA, West Virginia, Kentucky, a lot of that, those reserves sit under the ground. And a lot of folks will just go buy land as a speculative play to hope that it's part of an area that's been identified um, by the energy companies to drill so that they can get a lease royalty out of it. That's highly speculative, especially if you're buying 10, 20, 30, 40 acres, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars up to millions, depending on how much you're buying as speculation. So I would hope that you have other primary order strategies for that property. And the, the, the idea that the energy company is gonna knock on your door and just start handing you paychecks every month is maybe number seven in the 
long list of strategies you're employing with that land. Um, but it is something they do. Uh, and, it, and it can be lucrative. It can be like, you know, a complementary monetization to your property that you already own for other reasons. Therein lies the key. You already own it for two or three other reasons and they come knocking on the door. Great. I just would not buy land to speculate unless you've got the inside scoop and you work at the energy company. But even then, I, I've never worked at the energy company. But I gotta believe that there's some conflict of interest or something that would put you in a bad spot legally after you bought it if they did come knocking. So, uh, but some of you might know more about that. Uh, timber kind of falls in that. So a lot of land you can buy, and depending on the type of trees and timber, um, how mature it is, uh, how thick it is, that you you might have a nice size um, timber tract that you could get select cut. And um, you could have it select cut so that you still have standing timber, you're still maintaining the ecosystem, but you've cut down select trees throughout and you're kind of letting regrowth take shape before you cut down consecutive years, three, five, seven years later. And again, this all depends on uh, the type of trees, their rate of growth, et cetera, et cetera, and what they're willing to pay for a board foot. Um, but you can sell timber and a lot of times folks will buy land and the timber pays for all or half of what the property cost them. And now they're free and clear. And now they're ready to you know, build or use the land in a different way. Um, the only thing I will say on the timber, I just, uh, I just hate when they buy the land and they just scorched earth and knock down all the trees. Uh, and those trees took 40, 50, 60, 70 years to grow that tall and they just cut it out. I can't tell anyone what to do with their land, uh, but the select method, you can have cons income for consecutive years and it maintains the natural ecosystem that you that you hopefully enjoyed and wanted in the first place. So I recommend that route. A lot of uh, universities, an arborist will come out, uh, you know, a grad student or the students will come out and they'll give you a, a free assessment and they'll kind of help you. And actually same with uh, ponds and aquaculture and permaculture, a lot of the universities or the state uh, division of wildlife and resources, they'll typically send someone out for free to give you like an initial consultation. They might charge you for more expertise down the road if you wanted them to be part of the project, but you could get some information on digging the pond, species of fish, um, aquaculture and plants to put in there for feed for the fish, how to kind of build the ecosystems on your particular property. So those are actually other resources. I should have brought that up, but you have to do that by your state. Uh, like for us in Ohio, it's Ohio DNR. Um, but every state has a division of wildlife and natural resources. So just look that up by state and you can get more information on that. Um, another trend that a lot of people are, are working on, and actually you, you don't even need a large tract of land. They're doing this in urban areas on rooftops is micro farming. Um, and I added many orchards in there, um, but uh, usually that's if there's already standing trees that are producing fruit <laughs> that you've purchased. And then they just kind of add on and uh, plant some additional ones for future years. Uh, and that's another, hey, uh, if you want to do micro farming, micro greens, uh, maybe you just want to have a large garden on your land plot and have a little uh, market farmers market stand at the front of the road or, or elsewhere, you have a plot of land that you can grow. Maybe you just want to do it for yourself. Uh, again, that's you, you could just use your plot of land and uh, rototill a nice big garden um, and have constant source of organic, healthy food um, all the time. Maybe put a greenhouse on it for year round if that's possible in your climate. Um, and I know a lot of folks, uh, some out West, the, the soil isn't always perfect for all situations, but um, of course you can do some of the other modern techniques and create your own, um, you know, raised beds and things and bring in soil from elsewhere to start, get something started. All right, uh, livestock and mini farming. Uh, that's another, another way, depending on how much you have, there are rules and regulations on this, but I will say this, um, uh, I've been in the insurance industry and we own an insurance, the digital online insurance company. Little known fact, in a lot of areas, 
even if it's residential and you would drive by houses one after the other, typically on some of those, you're allowed to have a couple horses if they're privately owned. <laughs> Which not everybody's going to do that, of course, and it doesn't make sense. But um, but sometimes you you can you can have a, a number of livestock. Again, you're going to need to check um, your county zoning and what they allow within their own zoning, whether it's residential or agricultural. Um, typically, if you're monetizing the agricultural activity, typically it requires the AG designation. But even then, it's limited. Uh, some uh, only allow so many hogs uh, versus chickens, cows, sheep, goats. So you'll need to know exactly by the species when you call. So word of the wise, if that's part of your overall plan, ask and ask if they have requirements. Like they probably have requirements for fencing, um, you know, buildings to shelter and things like that. But again, it, it just, there's so many different things that the counties require across the United States. You really need to get it straight from the horse's mouth. That's what I would do. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? All right. So we check that out. Um, also, too, um, you might want to connect with local 4-H and other farmers to network. And that way you can develop some long-term relationships. Maybe they help you. Uh, get started. Maybe you're a newbie. Again, a lot of this is for someone who's just buying land or hasn't bought land quite yet, but is thinking about it. And uh, uh, that you might build some long-term relationships. Maybe you have. Maybe you go over there and help them out, and it helps you learn and get caught up to speed. That's a great way to just kind of become part of that local community if you don't live in the immediate area already. Uh, Future Farmers of America is a fantastic organization, and uh, and given my prior point on investors buying up land, we need our private farmers to retain their land and generate yield and income more than ever. We need to maintain what is left before they monopolize and control food production, meaning we need to maintain the private farmers and, and keep them in business. Um, because I like them in that seat better than my government or anybody else that wants to control food prices and food and did it for a business play, because that means they want profit. That means it's going to go up in value. And that means they control scarcity or abundance. Bad idea, genes. All right. Uh, the other play is hunting and fishing camp or location, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this underlying reason to purchase also supports the backup plan to self-sustain an emergency scenario. So you can see as we're going, all of these still have a double value as you might be doing it for recreation hobby, but it still fulfills a Ramsian, and I'll use that term again, you know, emergency security situation. If you already have these activities going on, I'm assuming you've developed the infrastructure for it. And if something happened, you've already got a head start, right? All right, so hunting and fishing. Uh, if you have enough land, a lot of folks will do, uh, you can do hunting leasing. Um, and I probably should have added this in, uh, survival. Uh, uh, a lot of former military might do a survival class and they'll do the course and they need properties that they have full access to, to teach and teach survival courses, maybe marksmanship, maybe a shooting range and things like that on it. So. Um, actually, our train shooting range is one of the options down here. It's actually the next one. Same applies. Practice makes perfect. Aim small, miss small. So maybe you build in a very rural area. You have a land plot and you build an archery or a shooting range, uh, put up a small pavilion, set up your targets, make sure it's a safe environment uh, and that there's some structures. Um, it's been done before. Again, might not be for you, but that's just something that I know that folks are doing. Um, then the other one is just a, uh, if you're developing the property and you're putting a building on it, uh, VRBO, Airbnb, glamping, uh, be careful of the local zoning laws and regs though. Many of them are changing, uh, to prevent short-term rentals. Um, they don't like the idea. Um, th there's a number of reasons I'm not going to get into it either way. Um, I don't have a dog in that fight. So 
if you want to, great. I'm just giving you the things to, hey, caveat emptor, buyer beware, and uh, do your homework prior to purchasing land if that's your strategy. That way you can ensure the success of your investment long term. Okay, just watch that potential pothole. Uh, private RV lot and park. We sell a lot of land um, for folks that are saying, well, I don't want to rent a lot year in, year out and be beholden to the landlord. That's what it is. It's a landlord for a place to park and uh, paying for everything. I'd rather just put uh, my money and invest in myself and buy the land and put the amenities I want, pay it off eventually or in the near future or all at once and never have a um, never have a lot lease again, and I'm not beholden to anybody. I can continue to develop it further. I can create, um, I can build on it typically, uh, but for this RV lot, or maybe even you're trying to develop a private RV park, you, you for the RV park, you need to go to the county. Um, there's a, a lot, there's a, a lot of complexity added if you're trying to use the land as an RV park. <clears throat> You'll have to, um, look at zoning and things with the county, you'll be working with them closely. So for those of you that are in that mode, before you do not pass go, do not collect $200, call the county and start there because you got a lot of work ahead of you just with the county first. Uh, but if it's just you as the private RV lot, uh, depending on how long you, you'll be there, you might need um, to find a lot that allows RV living full time. Many do not. So you, so that's going to be your main challenge if you're looking for that. Is make sure the zoning is RV full time, and then folks will say, "Well, what counties do that?" Well, it's not the entire county; it's by lot. So you're going to have to look at what your exact parcel, the one you're looking at, do they allow RV living full time, or will they only give you a 180 day permit while you're building another building? which means now you have to build another building to get the permit because they want you to submit to that. Uh, well, what if you don't have a plan to build a building? Well, then you're not going to get the permit. So you got to think about that if you're looking to develop for a private RV lot. Um, and I know a lot of folks want utilities. Vacant land rarely already has all of the utilities or well or septic on it. If it does, very often, that's because a mobile home or manufactured home was removed years ago that were remnant and it, everything sat idle for a long time. That does not bode well. Those systems need to operate and work. They need to be fluid. So if a well sat for a long time, it may or may not be potable water and it may or may not be allowable. Maybe it was grandfathered in by the prior um, county regs. Maybe they've been updated. Well, now you have the added expense to get rid of the well <clears throat> in removal and maybe an old tank that's no longer valid. Now you have to get rid of it before you even get the expense of the new one. So be careful if you do find it because there's, a, there's some caveats there, right? But very often you're not gonna find that without a home already being on it, um, which is not a private RV lot. Uh, of course you could buy a place with a home on it and park there, but if it's allowed, but just something to consider because uh, I know a lot of folks are looking for that now and private, uh, an RV living full time is not a dime a dozen zoning. You're gonna have to look a little bit and you're gonna have to be willing uh, to do other things in terms of utilities, maybe alternate, maybe you do solar, maybe you dig an outhouse, maybe, uh, maybe you have a compost toilet, maybe, you know, think you just have to think through all that before you buy, all right? Uh, the other other monetization, ATV, dirt bike, side by side, uh, riding. Um, there are a lot of areas throughout the United States where they basically pay to ride. This would be large acreage, obviously, uh, maybe even a go kart track if you wanted to, in a rural area. Uh, again, you'll have to check with your zoning what's allowable. Outdoor music festivals or stages, um, for whatever reason, that seems to work. Folks like being out the woods with good music, and maybe some beverages, um, but uh, that could turn into something, especially if you start bringing crowds there. Uh, stargazing, telescope platforms with open removed tree canopy so you can see the stars. There's less light pollution uh, away from the city so you can get a good glimpse there. So that's something that might be uh, uh, a cool monetization. 
And, and then I'm going to do one last one. And again, there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of ways to monetize. And I'm not going to go into all that. I just wanted to give you something, a, a starter list of things that are tightly directly correlated to the land itself. And of course, there's all kinds of other stuff you could do that I haven't listed here. Uh, the last one is solar farming. Um, now, of course, you're generating um, surplus electricity. You're not using it on premise per se, and you're getting paid from the electric company. But of course, you have the incurred expenses to connect to the grid, purchase the transformer and panels and all the other equipment and connect and make sure it's all kosher with them. And uh, then uh, you still have county zoning uh, to work with, but uh, that is something to consider. You're just gonna have to do some research and get yourself set up uh, correctly for that, uh, for solar farming. So especially, and I actually should have solar and wind farming. Uh, Cause hypothetically you could have a plot of land with just grids of panels and multiple wind turbines um, on a piece of land that are generated electricity running it to uh, the transformer and then ultimately back to the power company and surplus to use. You're generating energy for them, so they're paying you, uh, but you would have to kind of see what you're into with equipment, run the numbers, and see what you're willing to do. So that's the last play uh, that I have for you. I don't want to make this video uh, four hours long, so there are many more land capitalization strategies that you can employ. However, I merely wanted to get you a ground up head start on what to think about initially when buying land, how to stack utilization potential in your favor, buy the land with multiple exit strategies and utilities while you own it, so that if one goes away, you're not destitute and wasted your time, you have a strategy to employ with the land but then you can feel confident starting your private land investing portfolio today when you start breaking those things down and answering questions for yourself to become more knowledgeable and therefore more confident moving forward to identify the right land for you. Feel free to check out our website, usrecland.com and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell so that you're notified of all of our new listings hot off the presses um, we typically have recreation land, we have uh, residential agriculturally zoned land uh, for a myriad of uses. And again, you don't need to buy uh, 20 to 30 acres in all cases. Uh, you can do a lot with half an acre, an acre uh, of land, and you can lower your expense for the land. Because remember, if you're buying land to develop it with homes and, and other uh, develop developments, working the land, you're going to have a, a number of expenses post land. So you want to try to lock that in as most cost effective as possible um, before you start working on the land, because that's where uh, the majority of your funds are going to go. In the development. So, at any rate, um, I hope this was helpful uh, to get you guys started. And please, um, please think about uh, the concept of the Great American Buyback. Uh, it might not happen in our generation and our time here, but you can see where this is going over decades, 50, 60, 75, 100 years. And if we start now, even just buying one, two or three small parcels per family and keep growing as we can, and I know sometimes money's tight, but if we keep doing that, we can actually maintain ownership of the country that we live in and we'll have a place for generations of our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren to live. They will not be beholden to foreign entities and uh, businesses here. And, and again, I, I hope I'm not making businesses and foreign entities all sound, um, you know, like bad folks. They're not. But you and I both know not everybody is our friend. Uh, not everybody is looking out for our best behavior. In fact, they're most likely looking out for their own, and they're not necessarily worried about the impact to you or I. So we need to take that stand now uh, before it's too late and they have too much momentum that we can't catch up and buy it back, okay? So please consider the great American buyback. I don't even care if you buy it from us, just buy it. I just want Americans owning American soil to the degree possible. Um, and uh, hopefully you can use the land and enjoy it with your family, create traditions, a legacy, uh, and the kids and grandkids will remember spending time with grandma and grandpa at the lake house, at the property, camping, 4th of July, all of those things. Um, 
that's what life's about, right? So, okay, guys. Well, hope you got some from this. Please subscribe to the website, usrecland.com. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. And hey, folks, get looking out there. Use your resources and happy land hunting.